那么他发言的题目呢是 the history and the evaluation of ATM surgery. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, you can. Uh, you've got my screen, so um, this is a thank you to Double Medical and the organizers for um, inviting me. This is a topic that is of uh, great interest to me for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to give some thoughts on how the technique has evolved and sort of where we're going with it. Um, um, and um, it, it, it's a lot about the sort of some of the equipment because I think I understand that that the, many of you are very familiar with OLIF um, and perhaps their type of retraction system. This does it in a different way. So I'm going to talk about some of those technique aspects. But if we just look at the history, as with all good things, um, it, it it it's evolved over many years. The the modern approach to um, ATP surgery really starts in about the mid 1990s with Michael Myers paper in which he described his antralateral approach to the spine. Interestingly, at the same time, he, he also published the modern description of um, ALIF surgery. Um, then not much happened. Um, and Silvestri, but the senior author was Rousseli, the, the, the famous French uh, spine surgeon, described the, the oblique technique. What was interesting reading this paper back then was that, that they, it was a, only a left-sided approach and they used a T-lift cage. And they said, because if they, if they used a straight cage, it would come across and into the contralateral foramen. And that was an experience that, that I echoed later. Then of course, we have Medtronic, um, Produce uh, re launched um, OLIF uh, 25 in or OLIF 25 in 2012, and in Australia we launched ATP the following year. Um, this is my how I came to ATP is that I'd learned ALIF in order to do disc replacements, and that then taught me how to do fusions, and and but the problem was that for the elderly, um, and I was getting learning, doing more and more deformity cases, there wasn't a good technique. Um, ALIF for the elderly involves a lot of vascular retraction and risk of vascular injury and a pure posterior approach with interbody cages, because I'm a great believer in interbody cages. Um, if you're doing PLIFs, then, um, then there's, you can lose you know, a lot of blood if you're doing multiple levels. So when XLIF was first um, um, announced uh, in around the 2006, I was quite interested in that. It took several years before they let Australian surgeons learn how to do it. And myself and three colleagues um, went in 2009 and we started doing XLIF in Australia. And that was a great help for, for multi-level deformity cases. Um, and I got reasonable at it, but then I got frustrated because, it, you know, it wasn't just as smooth as the advertising says. Um, there was a vascular injury uh, in case 10. And really at that point, I decided that I really wanted to see much better than I had been able to. And so I moved to a sort of mini open type of procedure. Um, and that was frustrating also, though, because there were still problems with sensory problems and the plexus. And I was working on that when I came across Meyer's paper. And then I started to use an anterior to psoas approach. And we started off with um, straight instruments um, because um, I developed a G-clamp that helped retract psoas. We developed dingo instruments that I'll show you in a minute that allowed us to um, um, avoid the iliac crest. And then that was launched, as I said, in 2013. Um, I started work then on the 5.1 system and that's now been on the go in Australia for a few years. So, um, and this is just, putting the sort of the the retractor because i've been interested in developing instruments for a long time so i developed an anterior lumbar 
retractor system to help with a lifts because I was frustrated with the a lift retractors. The G clamp allowed me to retract psoas. Dingo instruments allowed me to get around the crest and still get the cages at right angles. And then um, uh, I, I teamed up with Double Medical and we developed a lateral cage, which is still being produced and still used in Australia. And, um, uh, and then uh, the lateral A-lift system that I mentioned, we started to, to, to develop in 2015 and that's now been commercially launched last year. And I'm pleased to say that we, we sell that to um, a lot of different company, including, including those companies that have their own systems but some surgeons, particularly in Australia, don't want to use. So this is um, a useful reminder. This has guided me in my professional career. I've always been interested in developing things and I'm always looking for an easier way of doing something. So Zog here is, you know, hasn't conducted a randomized controlled trial on how to cook fish, but I think you'll agree. Sometimes common sense is very important. Well, but also, and this is the point of this, this picture is that we do nothing in isolation. And this is a picture I went to see Richard Hines and some of you may know Richard. Richard is a surgeon in, from uh, Melbourne in uh, Florida uh, in the US. And uh, I went here to see him really to understand how they were doing L5S1. And, uh, and as I say, so um, it, it's uh, often a, a a collaboration or a meeting and a sharing of ideas, even if you go and do things differently, but at least you understand how other people are doing things. I think you've got to give credit to Nuvasiv in this, for, in lateral position surgery. They were massive innovators and most people, certainly in, particularly in the West, come to oblique having learnt trans approaches. Um, and it's the frustrations with trans approaches that lead you to oblique. Um, but they really did a great job of educating and, and converting a, a new generation of surgeons to, to the use of lateral cages. And this is, it's still a dramatic effect when you, somebody for the first time sees, you take a case like this where the disc is, is almost completely gone and you know that trying to do that from the back can be very difficult, it can be very easy to damage the disc place. But um, with a, uh, in a lateral position, with a cob under II, it's very easy to put it across, open the disc, and then sequential um, dilators or, or trials allowed you to regain height very easily. It's a, a really powerful tool. So the other things about um, XLIF that I liked and um, were this, uh, that if you are designing an operation and you go, well, why, why do we want to, what are, what's the ideal method of anterior column reconstruction? So you want to um, maximally support your cage. So this worked from Grant Canal in, in Canada. The, the red, um, the, 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 you can see that the denser bone is here. So really this is where you want to put a, where you want to put your cage is over, is spanning this dense bone. You don't really want to put it in the middle. And as you know, these cages often end up much more medialized than this. Um, the lateral cage is the biggest cage. It's right in the middle. The A-lift cage is quite good, but it tends to sit um, in the middle. And, and the T-lift cage is fine, but there's not a lot of, um, uh, it tends to sit in the cancellous bone. But so the anterior column is well supported with a lateral cage. You get, it's the easiest way of restoring height and coronal balance to the spine. And um, because of the good access, you can uh, very easily prepare the end plate under direct vision. And that makes for a, a much better fusion bed. And then of course, this is uh, one of the more modern uses is the recognition that if you wanna get lordosis um, with a lateral cage, then you, it's really useful to be able to section the anterior longitudinal ligament. And that's an advanced technique, but, but it, it can be immensely powerful. You can get, you can get 20 or 25 degrees um, when you do that, and, and you can do it without any blood loss. So it's a really powerful technique for selected uh, patients. So um, why use a lateral cage? Well, I think the lateral cage is the best cage. But why would you, why go through a, the lateral annulus? Well, 
the lateral annulus. It's a, it's a ligament sparing approach. It's the only approach to the, the spine where you don't destabilize the spine. All the other approaches um, remove or, or section important ligaments. Um, but the lateral approach uh, stabilizes, is, is preserves the stabilizing structures. And in fact, once the lateral cage is in position, it's a more stable construct than it was at the beginning of the operation. And you can't say that about any other approaches and insertion of cages. Um, but this is where I differ from, from transoas or DLIF or XLIF, is that that question of why are we going um, through 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 the psoas really and um and of course this is a, i rather cheekily take this picture out of the uh one of the one of my books uh, on xlif but the white arrows you can see this space it's very consistent all the way up the spine uh, there's a space here um and, it, and and at four five where you can um get to the spine um in front of psoas and and lateral to the vessels. So it's, a, it's like, it's the obvious choice for how to get into the disc space. So this is the, um, this is if you like a summary of the equipment. Um, and really we don't need that much equipment. That's one of the nice things about the system is that it's relatively elegant and inexpensive. Um, and so these are the basic tools and I'll go through um, some of these in a little more depth now. So this is the, uh, how do we retract psoas? And uh, well, we use the G clamp and you can see that the, the, one of the unique things about this is this small little foot underneath and that's gonna go under the, the cup annulus. We have these various blades that will allow us to go around the crest and we have straight blades and a, and a variety of, of, of blades, but we really only ever use one. Um, it's typically this one that I use for 90% of cases. But you'll note that this fixes to the patient. The patient is um, supported themselves. The, the, the patient themselves supports the retractor. So we don't need to fix it to the table, which is great. So when the patient moves, the retractor moves with the patient. Um, here's a picture again of that tooth in the annulus. And this is the G clamp. It's, a, it's been an evolving um, system. And uh, this is, these are sort of early versions. Um, and this is the view. We just have a, usually have a one single blade here. It's now a sort of semicircular blade. I usually put a screw into the end plate here or the end plate here. The sympathetic chain, I usually move it behind the blade and we get a good access to the disc. And this is an artist's impression, but you can see how we've pushed sewers backwards. These are the blades that I use now to retract so, uh, to retract the peritoneum. Um, they have three channels. We can have lights and a, a single screw and you can put the screw in any of the three holes or the lights in any of the, th the three holes. And that's um, because it's semi-circular. So it's sort of shaped like this. You, you don't really, you only need a blade, one blade at the back and, and one at the front. Um, but then the question of, well, how do you avoid the, uh, the pelvis and the ribs? And, um, and this is why we have these um, uh, dingo instruments. And um, they um, avoid the pelvis at four, five. <coughs> and similarly, the ribs at two, three can overhang. So they get in under the ribs. They allow us to use a lateral cage and for it to remain truly lateral. We don't have to use this orthogonal maneuver. Um, which often doesn't really work. Um, so um, we don't have to do that. And we can have the, the, the assistant at the end of the bed. If that's vertical, they can tell you um, if it's vertical. And then you know with great confidence that this is vertical. And that's uh, obviously very safe. And here's another artist impression of how we know the cage can go in at right angles to the spine. So here's um, again, um, this picture just sort of shows us moving the cob around and the, uh, the um, assistant or the, often the, the sales rep would be saying away from you towards, just so you get this vertical. And, um, and we use that for the cob to take out the contralateral annulus. We have trials, we have cages. Um, and um, here we have a, a lateral trial 
This patient's had a previous lateral ALIF and we're doing the four five segment. Um, the blades are typically screwed to the front of the spine. This was a video we published on this. It's still available online um, in, uh, in 2013. The, the equipment's evolved, but the technique is really very, very similar. So it's a lateral position. We take the patient, and basically I do this as I would have done for um, lateral. It's not quite so critical, um, but um, my team are, are used to it. So we do it very quickly now. 5-1, I nearly always do through a transverse incision now. Um, you can use an oblique incision, um, but coming a little bit more medially just helps. There's less strain on the wound. Um, and this incision, this is, would be for a sort of at least three levels. A single, a single level or a two level you can do with, you know, five or six centimeters and you can get a perfectly good view um, of, of, of this. And uh, again, here's a picture with the, um, the screw um, attached to the bone and the, the G clamp blade in the annulus. And this stops you over retracting. It stops the retractor going back too far and potentially compressing the um, compressing the um, plexus inside the muscle. So if we, um, let me see if I can get rid of that. Yeah, if we can just look at this table, then um, this is a comparison of ATP versus XLIF. Um, and as you can see, we, um, it, it's still, we still position uh, very carefully. I think that's still important. It's probably not as important as um, in XLIF because we've got a lot more visual feedback. We don't use neuromonitoring. The muscles are paralyzed, so the wound is very mobile and the muscles easy to move. It's quite comfortable. You stand in front of the patient, not behind. Um, it's a mini open, so you've got good three, three dimensional view. The iliac crest is never in the way at four five, unlike with XLIF. Um, we retract the, the psoas posteriorly. We don't use neuromonitoring. We don't have to split it. Um, use a big lateral cage. It's very easy to section the ALL at the front, which, as I said, is very powerful. Um, um, whereas the, the, the equivalent, if you're doing it starting from the middle of the disc with an ACR, is a much more complex and rather frightening procedure. This one is all done, done under direct vision. The closed, uh, yes, it's going. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Is that okay? 